Okay, it looks like we have a, a number of people joining us already. Uh, welcome. Uh, thank, thank you all for logging in and joining us today. Uh, my name is Sadella Blatch, and I'm a program director at NIGMS uh, with the SPAD program. And we're really happy to um, have you all here, and especially our panelists who are going to share their insights with you on navigating research collaborations as a teaching base professor. So thank you all for joining. So before we start, I want to mention a couple of important things. We are recording this webinar so that we can post it on our website at a later date. So you'll be able to access this again. And as you have questions, please type them in the chat box. We're gonna have plenty of time to get to answer your questions. So the agenda for today's webinar, we'll start with some opening remarks from Dr. Allison Gammy. She is the Director of the Division of Training, Workforce Development and Diversity at NIGMS. We're gonna have panelists to share their insights, as I mentioned and I'll be introducing them and they will also tell you about their background. And then we wanna hear from you. We'll have questions and answers from the audience directed to our panelists, and that's gonna be moderated by Dr. Beirut Stevani. So again, I really wanna thank the panelists for sharing their time with you and with everyone. I also wanna thank David from NIGMS IT, who's extremely helpful and all the NIH staff that work with the Diversity Programs Consortium and the SPAD program. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Gammy for her opening remarks. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be here. And um, there's one more person we need to thank and that's Sadella, who's just done a fabulous job putting this together. So very much appreciate all her hard work and energy. Um, I want to thank again the panelists. I know you um, have a lot going on right now um, with, at your institutions and teaching and um, dealing with COVID related things still just uh, even after a year. So really, really appreciate your time. And I'm just going to end it there because I'm really excited to hear um, what the panelists have to say and to hear the discussion. So thanks a lot. Great. Thank you, Allison. So on to today's panelists. We have the pleasure of having Dr. Timothy B. Clark from the University of San Diego, Dr. Wendy M. David from Texas State University, Dr. Megan Nunez from Wellesley College, and Dr. Peter Woodruff from the University of Southern Maine. So they're gonna each start by telling you a little bit about themselves and the work that they've been doing and how it came about. So they'll, they'll take up to 10 minutes or so each to first introduce themselves, a little bit about their position and a little bit about their area of research. Then they're gonna describe the collaborative research project that they have. What are their roles compared to the roles of the other uh, researchers involved, how the project got started. They'll also share when in the process it was decided to seek external funding because I'll mention that all of these panelists are principal investigators for NIH R15 awards, and they all have collaborators with researchers that are external to their institution. So um, we all know that this can be an extremely beneficial, powerful um, way to approach research, of course, having collaborators, whether they're within your institution or at another institution, but in, especially sometimes for those faculty that have a significant teaching load, this can be especially beneficial. So we think they'll be really gonna have some great insights on how this can be of assistance. So they'll introduce themselves, their area, describe the collaborative research project, the roles, funding, and then they can share a couple of top tips that they may have, things that they found to be um, especially of use to share with you. And then after they've each shared, then we will have time for questions um, from you, our audience. So again, as you have questions, please enter those in the chat box and Beirut will moderate the question and answer session. So we can go ahead and I will stop sharing uh, the screen that's listing our panelists because they're gonna describe themselves. Um, so I don't know if we wanna start in alphabetical order. So Tim, would you like to get us started? 
Sure, I can go first. Um, so as Sadella said, uh, I'm at Tim Clark at the University of San Diego. Um, before I was at the University of San Diego, I was at Western Washington University uh, as a faculty member for four years. Uh, so between the two of those, it's been about 14 years that I've been a faculty member. Um, at the University of San Diego, uh, I'm in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry. We have about 15 tenure track and tenured faculty. Uh, our course load is about five courses per year. Um, and so we count a lab, a four hour lab as a course and a, a three hour lecture as a course. So it, it, it's uh, kind of standardized here uh, in that way. Um, my background is in organic and organometallic chemistry. Uh, and so my research program focuses on doing metal catalyzed uh, reactions, especially uh, borylation chemistry. And so we do a lot of organoboron chemistry and um, developing new catalysts for uh, reactions that are maybe related to energy, maybe related to, to uh, health, um, depending on the project and, and how we're going about that. So for this topic, um, I was thinking about this when I was invited about collaborations because about eight years into my career, I really didn't do any sort of collaborations. I, I had done everything uh, kind of on my own. Um, and, and at that point, something changed. And, and I don't know exactly how that happened or, or what made it happen. Um, but now I have many collaborations and, and, um, and the collaborations I have are very unique and distinct. Uh, and, I, and I thought what I could do instead of describing all of them is just briefly mention them um, in case there's some questions about uh, the nature of those and then go into some details on a couple of those. So the first collaboration I had uh, is, is related to the R15 grant that uh, recently uh, has, has completed. Uh, and this collaboration was with Greg O'Neill, who I uh, overlapped with at Western Washington University. Uh, and, and the collaboration started kind of organically, like, like a lot of them do, where uh, I had an undergraduate who was, had to finish his time at Western Washington after I left. Um, and I had a colleague who, who was working on a project and I had su some suggestions of some boron chemistry that would work well for him, uh, for his project. And so we decided that the student could try out this chemistry I was suggesting working for my, my um, colleague there. Uh, and that went well. And a couple of years later, we, we had a, um, a publication that came from that um, that I helped kind of kind of steer that project uh, throughout. And then after that, we decided, you know, maybe it would make sense for us to um, to bring our, our experience and our um, our levels of interest in our different projects together and come up with a project that kind of overlapped our, our two areas. And so this uh, together we submitted for, uh, for an R15. Uh, this was my second R15 uh, as PI. Uh, and it was kind of interesting how that worked out because we, um, we decided that I would be the lead, but it, but it was you know, fairly well split, um, maybe at most two thirds at USD and about a third at Western Washington University. Um, and, and, the, and so there, that, that project kind of evolved and, and now, uh, we recently submitted another R15 where he was the lead and I just had actually a minor role and he had other people with uh, other minor roles. And so it was uh, quite different in how that collaboration developed. Uh, I've also had an international collaboration through um, an NSF uh, grant supplement. So I, I was able to get an NSF grant supplement and spend uh, six months working with a, um, someone in Spain. Uh, and, and that collaboration resulted in a couple of publications and if it wasn't for COVID, I think I would have been uh, looking for opportunities to send some of my undergraduates to work uh, in Spain with, with the collaborator. And so that, that kind of shut that down pretty quick last summer. Uh, I also have a collaboration with Don Watson at the University of Delaware um, that, that is more on an NSF type project. Um, and that collaboration is kind of interesting because um, I've sent students, uh, they, they'll spend half of the summer working in my lab and then half the summer working in, in the collaborator's lab. And then uh, the last time we did this again before COVID, uh, he also sent a graduate student to work in my lab for half of a summer. And so uh, that work, result, work resulted in a, um, in a JAX uh, paper, a JAX communication uh, last year. And so that, that worked out really well. Um, I've got a collaboration with a computational chemist on a mechanistic project that, that we're uh, finalizing a paper for right now. Uh, he's at Mississippi State University. Uh, and then recently I was approached by Pfizer um, on, on a project, uh, project originally funded through NIH, 
um, on some chemistry they were interested in using. And so I have a recent collaboration with Pfizer. And, and in that case, we're, we're, um, that's all new to me working with industry. And so it's been a really uh, eye-opening process. And we're hoping as a group to get some preliminary results this summer uh, and then apply for some funding uh, in the fall, both through Pfizer and through NIH. So, um, so those projects um, obviously are all quite different and, and kind of um, span very different interactions. And so kind of the theme that I try to do as I'm, I'm considering these collaborations is what's going to be best for students, you know, um, being able to send, send students to, the, to Delaware or to Spain to get that experience, but to still have them work on a project in my lab and to move a project forward um, in my lab is, is sort of a, um, a priority because I think when students go and do something different, it's really good for them, but then they come back and it's harder for them to have a meaningful project um, that, that kind of adds up and, and results in something in, 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 um, in their home institution. And so th these collaborations, I think, work really well for that. Um, I should say one other thing about my collaboration with um, Don Watson with the, that's kind of partially funded through NSF. Um, that was initiated through a um, collaborative program through Research Corporation. Um, they had a, a, a collaboration, a little funding for a collaboration to get things started. Uh, and and um, Don Watson emailed me and said, hey, you, you want to try to find, get this funding and get this going? And so there are little things like that that can get um, collaboration started that have been really good. In terms of tips, um, I think that um, one thing that, that I realized uh, pretty quickly is that uh, it's really beneficial for these R1 institutions to have um, faculty like, like myself um, on their grants because it's it's part of their broader impacts, uh, which which I don't always think of myself as broader impact, um, but but my students essentially are, are the broader impacts that that they get this diverse experience um, where they can be at an undergraduate institution, get some training, and then go to a, an R one or go into industry or to go internationally, and have an experience that really makes a difference. And so I sometimes am hesitant to to reach out on collaborations because we're so slow getting work done. Um, but as I think about, you know, it's, it's okay to be a little bit slow and to sort of leverage um, the great opportunities you have for students um, and, and um, be able to get a little bit of funding uh, for your lab through these experiences. And so that's, that's been my uh, approach is to really um, think about how you can leverage uh, the, the student experience and the value of the students uh, in somebody else's lab now, but also later when they, they might be pursuing a PhD or something like that. Thank you. Great, thank you, Tim. I'm sure people may have questions about the multiple types of funding you mentioned. So it's great that you that you reminded us that we may not only want to look at federal funding, but is there industry funding and other sources like that? So excellent, thank you so much. Um, how about uh, Wendy? Would you like to go? Thank you, Sadella, and thank you for uh, organizing and inviting me to be part of this panel. I probably have a different uh, trajectory than most of the other panelists. I am a medicinal chemist by my graduate training and a bioanalytical chemist by my postdoctoral training. And I started off uh, in a tenure track position at Texas State University where I am still a uh, faculty member, but now as a senior lecturer. And I have a passion for teaching, and one of the reasons why I applied for a position at Texas State was because of its um, focus on undergraduate education, and we still do not have a PhD program in chemistry. Um, we have obviously an undergraduate program and a master's uh, program, but our master's program is uh, more focused on preparing students for industry or for PhD programs. Um, and Texas State, however, has undergone a tremendous change in the 15 plus years that I've been at the institution. And the uh, institution has grown at least double in size and has a goal of becoming an R1 uh, institution. So when I joined on the faculty, um, you know, I can just say, all of the uh, goalposts for tenure were constantly shifted. And I did not, um, I wasn't 
going to be successful in that process. And uh, I have a lot of, however, uh, very good colleagues and I have a position as a senior lecturer. So I have an unusual, I think, uh, perspective <laughs> starting off in a tenure track position, but now I'm non-tenured, but at the same institution, that's probably not very common. Um, so I had students, both undergraduate students and some master's students that were working with me uh, doing surface plasma and resonance investigation of uh, biomolecular interactions. And because of my focus on bioanalytical chemistry, uh, it, it wasn't necessarily a particular project that I focused on, but several different projects. And one of them was uh, then led to us putting in the uh, application for the R15, and that was to look at critical residues for um, function and stabilization of the epithelial sodium ion channel. And I was a co-PI on that grant. It wasn't um, my primary research focus, but my part of the grant was to contribute the um, expertise in SPR and in binding interactions. And so we tried two times for funding. And finally, on the third um, submission, received funding also with an outside collaborator. And I would say that uh, my ability to uh, interact with a lot of different colleagues, both on my own campus and across the board, is what allows me to continue to be involved in research even to this day. So I still mentor undergraduates in research and uh, I, I no longer direct student thesis research as a senior lecturer at Texas State. But I, I do have um, some tips for people who may be in my position that have a very heavy teaching load. So lecturers uh, at Texas State have a teaching load of four classes a semester. And it's pretty difficult, as I'm sure all of you would agree, to be a PI on multiple grants if you're teaching four classes of maybe 50 to 100 students each per semester. Um, and somebody, and my passion is teaching, and I don't view that as something that I don't want to do. So I'm actually very happy with my position, but I also view teaching as training the next generation of scientists and they need to know about, the students need to know about research. I introduce research into my classes. I talk to the students about it. I don't want the students to think that everything they need to know is in a textbook that was written or, you know, 10 years ago or that they can Google and find in a few minutes online. So I try to in my classes, talk about my own research and get them excited about opportunities. So that's my first tip is to incorporate the types of research that you are doing or that you would like to do into your own courses when you're talking to your students, get them excited about it. Because as a teaching professor or a lecturer, you have probably more contacts with students than many of the uh, faculty who are responsible for research in the department. And that in that way, you can reach out and be the mentor for many of the students that could get involved in these projects. My second tip um, is to make sure that you participate fully in the, the research life of your department, even if you aren't a tenure track faculty member. So I go to seminars. I talk to my colleagues about their research. I tell them what I am interested in and what I'm doing. If they don't know that you're interested in doing research, why, why would they ask you to contribute? So I go to conferences, but not during COVID. <laughs> and I try to make, keep those connections going and not cut myself off from the wider uh, field. So that would be my second tip for making sure that you have an opportunity to be involved. Thank you, Wendy. I love how you mentioned bringing research into the classroom. And I think there are some excellent um, ideas we may have time to follow up on about that, um, because that could potentially, you know, 
help research preliminary data perhaps or something like that. So that, that's an excellent point you made. Thank you, Wendy. Um, Megan? Thank you so much. Um, so my name is Megan Nunez. I am a professor of chemistry at Wellesley College, which is an um, undergraduate liberal arts college for women in um, Eastern Massachusetts. Um, I've been here for about eight years. And before that, I was a professor at Mount Holyoke College, which is an undergraduate liberal arts college for women in Western Massachusetts. So, you know, super different. Um, so I've, I've been doing this for about 18 years. Um, my current position is that I'm Dean of Faculty Affairs. Um, and so I have kind of a, a new and different perspective on research because I sit on the tenure and promotions committee and help to evaluate other faculty members' research. And so um, I'll come back to that when I get to tips. Um, my field of study is that I, um, I'm, a, I'm a DNA chemist first. And so a lot of my research uh, is really focused at looking at unusual DNA structures, DNA damage in particular, um, but also hairpins and quadruplexes and um, thinking about how uh, proteins interact with DNA when it has sort of unconventional shapes and dynamics. Um, and that's kind of out, grown out of my graduate work. Um, and then in my um, postdoctoral work, I did some work on bacterial adhesion. And so I still have a project that's continued on that as well. And thinking about how bacteria stick to each other and stick to surfaces and kind of recognize the, the physical and chemical properties of the thing they're sticking to. Um, and I have a pretty big research group. I usually have about 10 people in my, uh, in my lab. Um, I like to take undergraduate students as first years, um, right out of like, my gen chem classes. Um, and cause it gives them a chance to be mentored by older students and to kind of grow into their projects over time so that they actually have a chance of getting the skills and the understanding to be able to make enough progress to contribute to a publication. Um, and so, uh, so in my group at any one time, I'll have a couple of students on each project at different ages. Um, and I also often have some students who'll stay after graduation for a few months or a year. Um, and once they've done a senior thesis, a lot of times they'll have these great revelations about how their project actually is supposed to work and then they leave, which is just heartbreaking. And so one of the things that I've, I've done with my grant funding is to um, try to keep those students on for a little while after they have their aha moment so they can actually do something with it, <laughs> which I've actually found to be really helpful. Um, so I have a lot of collaborative projects. Actually, every project in my lab at this point is collaborative and I was really interested in what um, what Professor Clark said, because when I started out, um, I did in fact have one project that uh, was not collaborative because one of my senior colleagues um, who noticed that I like to work collaboratively and that I was working with my postdoc advisor said, took me aside and said, you, we can't give you tenure if you can't demonstrate that you're independent. So you need to have a project of your own. Um, and so before tenure, I, I did a bunch of my DNA stuff kind of on my own. And then as soon as I got tenure, I was like, okay, enough of that. <laughs> And so, so now all my projects are collaborative. Um, and so when I think about what that's about, I think there are a few pieces and, you know, and again, I think um, Professor Clark alerted, uh, uh, alluded to some of those, you know, collaborative projects really provide opportunities for my students to see what graduate school is like and what different institutions are like um, that I can't provide them in my own lab, right? There are great things that I can provide them. They own their project. No grad student's gonna take it away from them. No postdoc is bossing them around. They really are super intellectually engaged with it, which is great. But then when they go to pick a graduate school, they don't even really know how the game is played, right? Like they don't know what the groups are like, how should they pick a group? So it really helps to have collaborators so they can go visit or spend a summer there and get a sense of like, oh, that's what graduate school is like. So I think that's been really good. Um, and um, as you mentioned earlier, both sides, it's good that both sides get something out of a collaboration. And so I'm happy to be people's broader impacts. I teach at a women's college. Um, we have a lot of underrepresented students. And so, you know, if it helps my students to go do science somewhere else, they bring good knowledge back to my department. If what the other side gets out of it is, hey, I, I'm your broader impacts, I have no problem with that. So um, I think that one of my collaborations has worked out that way. I collaborate with um, Mark Williams at Northeastern. We have a, we've been collaborating a long time now, probably about 17 years. Um, and it's a great collaboration. He's a physicist um, and his students are physicists. So they, his lab is almost all men. 
And so they're really excited to get young women who are interested in physics to come work in the lab and, and work with optical tweezers on DNA. Um, they're physicists, so they don't like to make molecules. And so we love to make molecules. So we make DNA assemblies, we make coordination compounds, we do all the synthetic work um, and bring it over. So we're bringing something to them that they you know, really don't wanna do themselves. And so I think that's a second piece, right? What does each side get out of the collaboration? Well, they're getting molecules and broader impacts. And I'm getting a really cool set of data that I don't know how to acquire, right? I'm, I'm not gonna build optical tweezers and, and run it in my lab. And so it's a nice win-win um, for everybody. And my students see a different situation. So I think that is really good. Um, another piece in collaborations, I have two collaborations with other friends and colleagues at liberal arts colleges. And so, you know, they, they have similar pluses and minuses to their research program is that what I have. Um, so what I really get out of it is collegiality, right? I love working with my students, but they don't bring the intellectual contribution to my lab sometimes that I need, right? I'm just, got, just stumped by some problem and they, they don't know how to fix it. So having another PhD to brainstorm with and be like, I have never seen anything like this in my life. What is this, right? I just read this paper. Have you seen this? This is amazing. It's really great to have that. And so, um, and when you're at a liberal arts college that's small, I am the only nucleic acid chemist. Nobody's in my field at my institution, right? And so, you know, I have colleagues, I have other biochemists and they can sort of try to help, but it's not quite the same thing. So that's another real benefit of, of collaboration is having that collegiality for me that, you know, brings me that bit that I would otherwise miss. Um, and then also finally, um, there's momentum, right? There's a definite different times of year, we get a lot of research done. I have a relatively light teaching load. So I teach two classes a semester um, when I'm not in the Dean's office. So, um, you know, that's not so bad, but it's still enough that I don't get a lot of research done. And my students are taking two class, you know, four classes. So they're really busy. And so most of our research happens in January and summer. And so collaborating with other people who understand that the work's going to get mostly done in January and summer um, actually is really important. And so having, I do have that one university collaboration, but that's a group that's been really understanding of this, you know, that yes, I know you need the molecule, but it's not going to happen till July. Um, they've been really good about that. So, um, so that's what I get out of it. And I also rolled into it sort of some of my tips, but just to cycle back to that tenure expectation, I do think if you are on the tenure track, that it's really important to have um, a really candid conversation with your department about what their expectations are for demonstrating your research independence versus publication. And are they gonna not count something if you're not the primary author or the PI of the grant? Um, and just making sure that you're all on the same page, I think is really um, an important thing. Thanks, May, and that's, that's a terrific point as uh, you know, we may have to juggle our teaching, our research, but also keeping in mind the lens of what we need to do to keep our jobs. So that's certainly an important thing to think about. And I like your advice to have conversations early so that this understanding is clear. So excellent. Thank you so much, Megan. Uh, Peter. Uh, so my name is Pete Woodruff and I'm a professor at the University of Southern Maine uh, in Portland, Maine. And uh, I got my undergraduate degree in biophysical chemistry and then my graduate degree in molecular and cell biology, but I was, you know, one of the bio uh, molecular people who was in a chemistry lab. So it was, you know, all fairly chemistry focused. And um, kind of echoing what others have said, my trajectory here has not been the normal trajectory. So uh, I moved to Maine to follow my wife who got a really good academic job. And my plan was to raise the kids. And then uh, I got a visiting teaching job at one institution. And then I got a visiting teaching job at this institution at the same time, which was not exactly fun. Um, and then a tenure track position opened up. And I was like, you know, I have these ideas. I've got some preliminary evidence. I'm going to apply and try it out. Um, and so our, uh, at the University of Southern Maine, um, they were actually pretty open with me during the hiring process about what the tenure expectations were to the point that I've never met anyone else who they actually, they just told me like, we want three papers from you. We want outside funding and your paper should have undergrads as co-authors, right? You can't just do the research yourself. We expect you to train people. And I don't think I've ever met anyone because it's always some nebulous, oh, we want you to have an impact where we want you to, to do independent research. And it, they were actually just like, okay, here's what we want. Um, and so my teaching load is, uh, I think, 
relatively on par with what others have said. So I teach generally three classes a semester. Um, my upper level biochemistry lab is actually a fairly long lab. So I occasionally get a course release because I teach two sections of that in the fall. And so sometimes I get a course release in the spring, the extra time that I've put into it. Uh, the class sizes vary from um, you know 15 to 20 for the labs. And I would say 20 to 100 for the lectures. You know, Gen Chem, when I teach general chemistry, it's got 100 or 120 people in it. My upper level biochemistry class has 50, maybe 60. And then um, other classes, uh, some very upper level stuff sometimes only has 20 people. Um, so uh, I guess lecturers at our institution teach a 4 4, so they teach four classes a semester. So we technically get a course release for research, but you know, it is a primarily undergraduate institution. And so those, you know, you, you have to temper your research expectations a little bit. And I think. Uh, others have said very well that during the semester, not a whole lot gets done. And that's okay, right? That's kind of expected. You're going to get the most of the work done. Um, I'm impressed that, that you said you get stuff in January. I get nothing done in January ever. I always say I'm going to get stuff done. It doesn't happen. Um, so most of our work gets done in the summer. Um, so uh, I'm, a, I'm a biochemist. So I'm the biochemist in our department. And the department's fairly small. So I'm the only one who's doing biochemistry. And so uh, the way that my project started was actually, uh, I was at a, um, a mentoring workshop for new faculty. And I ran into a guy who was a postdoc in the same lab I was in. We never overlapped. He started after I left. And um, we were just talking about research. And he, uh, he was, he's a synthetic organic chemist. And uh, we both happened to work on the sugar called trahalose, which is used in microbial stress protection. And uh, I had shown in my graduate work that uh, mycobacteria needed to survive. And, and you guys might not have heard of it, but if any of you do any baking, then you're used to it, right? The reason that you can get like dried yeast powder is they replace all their water weight with trahalose. And if they don't have the ability to make trahalose, then they can't do that. So they can be completely dehydrated until you throw them into warm water with sugar. Um, mycobacteria though, they need trahalose constantly, whether they're under stress or not. And so what, uh, what Ben had done, what my collaborator had done, is he had done synthetic organic chemistry to modify the structure, right? Because that's what biochemists do, right? You, you identify a molecular target and then you try and mess with it. And, um, you know, you can do that kind of organic chemistry. It generally takes uh, months and you might get 10 milligrams of a product. And he was trying to move into chemoenzymatic synthesis where you take enzymes that normally make it and you feed it alternate substrates and they make it for you. And so he had asked me if I had a certain set of enzymes to do this chemoenzymatic synthesis. So it was a, a three enzymes in a three-step process. And I was like, yeah, I have them, but I also have this enzyme that does it all in one step. Uh, why don't we try using that one instead? And so we just like just started emailing each other and he worked out this amazing purification protocol. So we can go from synthesis to purification in an hour as opposed to doing the traditional synthetic organic chemistry where it might take you months and only get 10 mg. And so what we did is um, I started purifying the enzyme and I would do preliminary substrate testing and I'd send him the enzyme and he would do, he had much better equipment so he could quantify things much better. Um, and then we uh, submitted a paper on it. And it was at that point where we decided like, okay, we submitted a paper, let's go for an R15 grant. And uh, that was the decision point for us. We hadn't gotten the paper accepted yet, but we figured it was a, a good use of our, uh, good evidence of our collaboration. And um, we got that grant and it was just renewed last year. And, uh, you know, we've been publishing with undergraduates. Uh, we published, you know, a couple papers a year since 2014. And it's been a really fun collaboration. Um, he's at sort of a, uh, not quite an R1, not quite an R15. Right, so he has master's students. I only have undergraduates. Um, I guess I could take a biology master's student if I really wanted one. Um, and so uh, he gets the majority of the money from the grant, uh, somewhere between two thirds and three quarters. And uh, we had originally split it where I did some of the enzyme prep and some of the substrate testing and analysis. And over time, it's just become that um, we, we need a whole bunch of enzymes. We need to test the native enzymes that degrade the trahalose molecule because if we make this analog and it automatically gets degraded before it can ever work, it'd be useless. So now I'm purifying trahaloses from a bunch of different species. So uh, it's sort of morphed into I'm purifying the enzymes and sending them along. And then he is uh, doing substrate testing. He's got a biosafety level three lab. So he throws them on mycobacteria. Um, 
and it's been a really fun uh, project to be involved with. Uh, I have another collaboration uh, with Alan Hochbaum at UC Irvine, and for that one, um, I guess I should say just straight off that I tend to have a little bit of social anxiety. So the fact that uh, that I just emailed Alon at UC Irvine out of the blue is like, hey, I'm going to be on sabbatical and I want to be someplace warm for a year. Like, and he was studying biofilms and I really wanted to start testing our, uh, my system in, in, in biofilms. I wanted to learn how to uh, do all that kind of experimentation. And at that point, you're basically free hands, right? You know, you're, you're doctorate level, you're free hands. And, and so I just emailed him out of the blue. I was like, hey, I want to try this project in your lab. I can help out on your stuff too, um, um, for free. And, uh, and that worked out too. And we're currently prepping a, a publication on that work as well that I'm really excited about. Um, um, in terms of uh, tips or suggestions, um, I really believe in, in first of all, the like, very small conferences is a good way to network with people. You know, when you're at a, a, a huge conference like the ACSS, ACS where there's 10,000 people, it's kind of hard to, to connect with people sometimes. But when you go to a Gordon conference, or in this case, this mentoring workshop, it was a great opportunity just to like sit around and talk with people and learn cool stuff. Um, so I recommend uh, small conferences. Um, I think setting expectations is also very important. And uh, you know, others have said as well, like, you know, stuff's not gonna happen necessarily during the semester. And I think if you if you're open and upfront about that at the beginning, I think people will be very understanding as opposed to thinking it's like, you know, at an R1 where there's an army of graduate students or postdocs. Um, and so I think it's just important that, that you say like, okay, like I'm gonna do this, but it might, might not happen until June or July. And I think once you explain the situation, I think people are much more understanding of how that works. Great, thank you, Peter. I love that advice, uh, that little story you told about sort of feeling intimidated to contact someone out of the blue or somebody at a, a more resourced institution. And I think that's such, such great advice because you never know. I, when I used to be faculty and I did research on fruit flies and I would often be surprised when a faculty member who did similar work, but in mammals at a, you know, research intensive institution. And I was at a very small university with a heavy teaching load. They would be, whoa, well, what happens in fruit flies? Maybe you can look at that. I was shocked that they were sort of interested and I felt intimidated to participate, but you know, a lot of times it could be the matter of getting a piece of a puzzle and maybe we don't do the whole puzzle ourselves, but we're all working together. So I, I think that's a great example of how we may want to get over that intimidation sometimes and reach out. So thank you, Peter. That, that's excellent. Um, so now we have time for um, questions from the audience. I think all four of our panelists have already given us a lot of great input and information. Um, I know there's several things I think it would be interesting to follow up on, but um, Beirut, I'm going to turn things over to you. Uh, thank you, Sidella, and thank you all the panels, panelists for sharing their great experience. Uh, from uh, collaboration at undergraduate level with postdocs, with industry, with outside sources, internal. Uh, this was a great example. So um, if you have any question, please uh, uh, write it in the chat room. But I will start with one. Interestingly, I went and look at your summary statements for your R15 and search for the word collaboration and for summary statement 48 times the word collaboration was there. So these are like I'm reading from your uh, summary statement. A strong collaboration team that resulted in multiple uh, publication, superb undergraduate participation in a highly collaborative environment, productive collaboration in the previous funding period. Um, the addition of a collaborative postdoc will add value as he ties two projects a strong collaboration in place to accomplish the work proposed, highly qualified team with established collaboration. The PI has been collaborating extensively as evident by joint publication. These are just example from your own summary statements, maybe you recognize from this. So my first thing, how you convince the review panel that you are collaborating? So what are your uh, secrets? What are your tips for the, uh, our participants? 
the letter of support is helpful or you when you are starting writing the grant you start a week before part uh, submission or like in advance you take time six months eight months or ten months or something what are your what you can share with us I think what Peter said were, you know, it's nice to have some significant preliminary results and, and, a, and a publication either submitted or, or uh, published uh, between the two of you really goes a long ways in, in uh, one of these federal grants uh, noticing and saying, yeah, it looks like this is, this is um, going to work and, and that they can collaborate together at different institutions. I have a colleague who has struggled to convince um, uh, reviewers that that their collaboration would work and they've been collaborating for 15 years and had multi, multiple NIH grants. And so sometimes there's, there's, it just depends on, on the agency and, and the Institute and everything you're going to. But, but I think um, having that, that track record is really important. I would second that, that the collaboration started before the grant quite a bit before. And in my case, uh, I had students that were working with me using surface plasma resonance for uh, determining some kinetic constants, but in a system that was important to my collaborator. And that was ongoing before we ever said, well, let's put this together into a grant. So it wasn't something that was created for the grant, it was the other way around. I mean, I would say I have a lot of different kinds of collaboration in terms of how the projects are broken up. So, you know, I have one collaboration that is very much 50-50, right? Someone I've been collaborating with for a very long time. Um, I would consider us fairly equal co-PIs. And then I have other collaborations which are really minor where I'm maybe not even a co-PI, maybe I'm just a, writing a letter of support. Um, and And I think, you know, I think it's, as, as Wendy pointed out, like things kind of grow, right? Before you get to the point of maybe being co-PIs on a grant, you might be just supporting or you might write a paper or you might have a small bit of funding from somewhere else and work your way up. Um, it's hard to make that leap from, we met at a conference and we've got a few ideas to an R15 if there aren't other steps in between, right? Some demonstration that the collaboration is gonna work and not, not just for the NIH, but I think for both halves of the collaboration to feel like this is a useful endeavor, this is gonna work, I can see that we're gonna get something out of it, we know how to communicate. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. And uh, there are a couple of questions in, in the chat room, I will read it for you. The first one is from Dr. Gareth Hester. Uh, aside from complementing your work through a different expertise, what kinds of specific roles do you collaborators have in supporting your research? What roles for collaborators are helpful for those of us at undergraduate universities? Peter, do you want to answer this question? Yeah. Uh... I just want to make sure I understand the the, the question here. Um, if you, are you asking what our collaborators, uh, the people we collaborate with, do to support our research? So the question is, uh, of course, sometimes we are being complementary expertise to accomplish a project. But the question is, what other kind of specific role do your collaborators have in supporting your research in addition to uh, complementary expertise? Um, well, we certainly have the complementary expertise. Uh, one thing that we that we uh, discussed and unfortunately got sidetracked by COVID was um, uh, my collaborator has he's a, in a chemistry department and he's more of an organic chemist, whereas I'm more on the bio side. But he has more of a bio uh, grad student in his lab, and we were going to do an exchange of students where uh, his student was going to come here and I was going to send one to his place at Central Michigan University, and just sort of like uh, have that exchange of ideas where we could start uh, kind of bringing each other up to speed on our, our, our uh, areas of expertise to really help move the collaboration forward. So we weren't necessarily always relying on each other for one thing if the other one could then do it. Um, and, you know, we, we talked about, we've talked about this for years and, uh, you know, unfortunately I don't even think it'll be possible this year with travel restrictions necessarily, but um, that's one thing where we can actually support each other in the collaboration as well. Thank you. Uh, go, Megan. Um, I, I've actually had sort of fortuitously very good 
um, support from my collaborators in unexpected situations. So we had a, we did major building construction and my lab was basically shut two years ago. Um, and my collaborators were willing to take my students on for the summer and really advise them, um, which was really, which was a fantastic experience for them. Um, but it was just really helpful for me because I literally couldn't provide a research experience for them. Um, and, you know, I might not have expected that maybe 10 or 15 years ago when I met them, but when the circumstance came up and everything was a mess to be able to rely on them, I think was really huge. Um, and I'm really grateful for that and looking forward to taking some of their students into my lab when this COVID thing is done. Excellent point. Um, uh, next question is from Matteo and he asked, did any of you use a workbook to help in grant preparation? And did you have a professional reader review your grant? So it seems that the answer is no, yes. <laughs> uh, I mean, in, in our case, uh, we definitely had colleagues review the grant to offer suggestions, but we didn't use any, or and I didn't use any kind of a workbook or guided process. But I don't know if, you know, partly that might rely on the fact that when I was a postdoc, my, my PI already was having me help write grants. So as a postdoc, I was trained in the process of writing a grant. Excellent. And actually, yeah, we, we, the, in addition to like professional readers for the, your grant, there are workshops that you can attend that you can maybe helpful for grants writing. And I mean, many institutions, maybe not the smaller universities, they offer like this service of, for grant writing. Uh, I don't know if your universities offer this service or not. Um, this is a question for Wendy. Um, how have you been able to navigate continuing with research now as senior lecturer? Were the expectations maybe for teaching only? Have you met resistance in terms of using research funding to buy out some of your teaching time? Yeah, thank you for the question. It's a good question. And I have to say the key is the support of the chair of the department. So if I didn't have the support from the administration, it wouldn't be possible. But my experience has paved the way for some future senior lecturers that also want to participate in research. And so since I was able to continue, I don't have my own lab, but I have colleagues who will host my students in their lab. So that requires me to collaborate with my own uh, internal uh, colleagues at my institution, again, because I'm not a PI, but that process is dependent on the goodwill of my chair and I always keep him updated on anything that I'm doing throughout the year. And so I think communication is key and I learned through trial and error. <laughs> some of you have done a better job. Some of the panelists have already mentioned that they uh, we're good up front at being clear with expectations and communication. And I've learned that a little bit more through trial and error, but now at this point in my career, I know how important it is. Thank you, Wendy. I think this question is for Megan. They ask, have any of your undergraduate students gone to the graduate school at your collaborators' institutions? Um. For me, generally not. A couple of them have, but most of them um, actually haven't gone to those particular institutions, but I think they've been inspired by the experience to think about a wider set of graduate schools. And interestingly, in my case, um, the students that I sent to work with the collaborator didn't end up going to graduate school, but other students from my group chose to go to that institution that, that, without that experience um, and I think it's because, you know, they hear from the other student. Yeah, that was a great place. They had, I had this experience and I liked it. And this person was good. They didn't work for my collaborator when they went, but, but they, they considered it a, a reasonable option for themselves. 
Thank you. This is a great point, actually, how a small collaboration like uh, be expanded and going to the bigger, have a bigger impact. Mm, so another question that we have, do most of the full-time teaching faculty use course releases in their grant budget? No, uh, we have the opportunity to use it in our uh, grant budget, but um, there are political consequences to that. You know, I'm in a small department. If I'm not teaching the class, who's going to teach it, right? So we're, we're stretched pretty thin in terms of uh, faculty. And so um, we have that option of putting it in the grant, but um, I don't know many people at my university who have done it just because uh, kind of everyone Everyone's in a department where uh, if they're not teaching, then they're putting something on their colleagues and, and people don't want to do that. I would totally agree. Same is true where I am. Excellent. I just, I mean, certain, certain NIH programs actually, they require the release, research uh, release from the teaching when you submit your application. For example, if you submit a K award, you have to read the program announcement if this is a requirement, so you should include that. So if it's not a requirement, so you have to go away, find a way to go around that. In our case, um, it's a little bigger department, and so it's not as, as uh, much of a trade, and we have some non-tenure-track faculty that, that can expand their loads. But it's still not very common for people to put that into their grant. Uh, it's actually more common uh, it used to be more common that, that when you get a big grant like that, that there would be a match from the university that wasn't ever said in the, in the proposal um, that, that said you would get a teaching release per year. And that's how a lot of people would get down to five courses instead of six courses. Uh, we've kind of changed that structure a little bit and it's, it's more directly related to working with students rather than getting grants. Uh, but if you had a, a number of grants, then, then that would be a possibility uh, to do at our institution. Yeah, I would say that the institutional uh, commitment is pretty important in the grant application process. And uh, in our case, because we're also not a very small department, we have additional faculty that can cover some classes if we aren't able to cover it, which is not the case everywhere. Uh, and so that's a little bit different situation. But one of the things that they have done recently in my department for people in my position who are not tenure track faculty is to give credit for mentoring undergraduate students as course load. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't usually get course load release, even though it gets added onto your workload. But, um, but they have actually started, you know, adding that onto the course load because we have so many undergraduates, it helps in terms of getting more mentoring of undergraduates in research for us to help with that endeavor. A great point. And another question is, what level of pre and post award sponsored programs infrastructure do each of the panelists have their institution? What level of pre and post award sponsored programs? We have an office of sponsored programs that um, that helps make sure we're following the guidelines in in submitting, you know, uh, especially federal grants. Um, so they'll just sort of check that we've got everything and 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 do that. But we have you know two people for for the entire university uh, that that do this process. So the level of, um, of time commitment that you can expect from them is is, is not huge, um, but but it is important sort of on the front end to, to kind of clarify questions and re, uh, requirements and, and things like that. Uh, we also have a grant management on the back end um, that that sort of makes sure that that the the what we spend the money on fits appropriately for the requirements of the grant, and so all of that happens. And if if that office is fully staffed, then we might have a quarterly meeting to talk about the, the status of the grant, but I think that's only happened like three times in my career. So it's never fully staffed. I would, I would say that I think this is actually really important when you're talking about collaborations. 
um, because there's often some kind of subaward involved. So it's a whole nother level of paperwork and complication, both at pre the pre-award stage and also the post-award to make sure that the billing happens properly. Um, so th this is actually really important to make sure that there's someone who will help you make sure that, you know, kind of things are done right. Everyone's getting paid, nothing's getting overspent. Thank you. So I have a question myself. We talked a lot about the benefits of collaboration. So just maybe other challenges of collaboration. So especially when it's coming to publication, who will be the first author, who will be the last author? So how you go around this? Do you start discussion before starting collaborating or you just let it go, especially when a senior investigator is involved, because now sometimes you are a junior investigator and you want to work with the seniors, sometimes you are at the same level. What are your tips or suggestions about that or going around that? So uh, obviously communication is very important. And we actually had this uh, issue uh, come up, not because of either me or my collaborator, but we decided to submit a patent on our work. And that you know started this whole bureaucratic chain, and so then we had the lawyers from our two institutions, and it moved along, and then it stopped, and we couldn't figure out why it stopped. And then we're like, okay, let's just sit down and say, and we just drafted a letter intended, like we split everything 50-50. and then based on that, we sat down with each other and was like, look, we have this collaborative project. We're, we're going to be on each publication. We're going to decide before each publication who's corresponding author um, and, and those types of things. And, and so far, it's, it's just been collegial, right? Because we have this sort of prenup where we, we hashed out these issues. And I, I'm very lucky that my collaborator was also uh, uh, a very understandable person where he's just like, okay, like here's the way the project's going to work. We'll just uh, have both our names be on all the papers that come from this project. Thank you. Um, just two new posts, the questions came up. I, and we have three minutes. I just want to like get an opportunity to those we answered as well. Um, the question is when a PD, PhD program is non-existent given the experience level of undergrads and some master's students, how much importance to your place and support from postdoctorates for your grant funded research? What are the primary roles for the post postdoctorates? I think it's challenging. <laughs> As everybody has mentioned, when you have undergraduates, it, uh, as soon as they know what they're doing, they're graduating and they're moving on. So it, it's always challenging, but uh, I have never had any postdoctoral postdoctor, post students that have worked directly for me. And, and that makes it challenging. But one of the things that I do try to do is pair up undergraduates. And so that they always have somebody to bounce ideas off of. And that has been something that has been helpful um, for me. Of course, that requires that I have a lot of undergraduates to work with. Uh, yeah, I've never had postdocs either in the lab. Um, I've had one or two uh, email me out of the blue and apply. And those never quite worked out, but it's it's not something I'm, I don't think our university really supports postdocs either. So I, I, I don't think they lost much. <laughs> so I've, I've mentored three postdocs at USD. So, and we don't have a master's program. So it, it, it does make a, a big difference. And those have been through uh, the two NIH grants and, and then an NSF career grant that had funding for, for those things. and. Um, and it really makes a difference when you can have somebody in the lab to sort of help mentor the students when I'm teaching or in a meeting or something like that. So it really was 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 an important experience again for the students, and it keeps things moving. Um, and and like anything, you know, you can have some some fantastic postdocs or or some that um, maybe struggle in a transition, and and there aren't a lot of other postdocs around, so it's a little bit of a different experience. Um, but but there are a lot of postdocs who are interested in, in careers like we have. And so um, it's a good opportunity for them to get a little, little bit of experience teaching. So a lot of mine will teach one or two courses a year and I'll mentor them in the, in the classroom. Uh, and then they will 
uh, spend most of their time doing research. Uh, and, and those things I think are, um, have been really helpful for my research program, but it's been a few years since I've had a postdoc in my lab uh, because of budget levels and things like that. Uh, yeah, so I've only had a postdoc once and I have to say, I thought it was really stressful um, because, you know, she really needed to get a job. So she needed to get stuff published and, and you know, quickly. And I don't know, I felt so responsible for her future um, and to be able to, you know, get the research out quickly enough was really stressful. I will say she went on to a tenure track position. She's now tenured and very happy. So I can sleep at night, but that's fine. Um, and I tried to hire a postdoc another time and actually found it really hard to get good candidates um, because it is a weird niche, right? I, I, in fact, I had a few good candidates and their advisors told them not to do it, that it was career suicide and that they shouldn't work at a liberal arts college. So, um, so I've really fallen back on hiring post baccalaureate students, you know, hiring my students after their thesis. And that for me has been great. Um, you know, they, they know a lot, they can, you know, the, the time equals money means money equals time, that they can take a lot of the tedious stuff off of my plate, you know, the ordering and the organizing the lab and the making sure the students easy questions get answered so that I can spend really high quality time with my research group. Um, and they usually have their own project finished too. So I, I think that that's a, a good, relatively inexpensive way to um, get a, you know, a baby graduate student basically in your lab. Excellent point. Thank you, Megan. And uh, just wanted to like answer the last question before I turn it back to the Sidella. Can the panelists uh, please describe how their research and grant leadership has been recognized at their campus outside of the tenure promotion? Has any such recognition helped motivate you to continue your research agenda? I guess I would say that, you know, the way the way they do things where they sort of match grants at the university, give you a little bit of release, those types of things motivate me, not that I don't want to teach, but that I'll have time to do the research and, and mentor students, which is obviously another type of teaching. And so I, I think that system was really important as I was considering moving to USD. They had these systems in place that were really valuable. Uh, I, I, a couple of years ago, got um, what they call the University Professor Award that, that recognizes teaching and research. Um, and, and I would say, yes, that, that sort of process that comes with money that I can use for research uh, was really valuable and appreciated. Uh, there's also little small things that they have um, to, to sort of um, help the research out along the way um, that, that I find valuable. Um, but usually if you're getting a major grant, you don't apply for those. So it's, it's kind of just depends on where you're at and if you're in between grants and things like that. Yeah, I, um, in terms of recognition other than tenure, uh, you know, I got a, a faculty research uh, award, which came with $500 in unrestricted funds. And I know that's not much, but it was still like, okay, I can try this crazy idea that I've always wanted to do. That's nothing, has nothing to do with my grant. I just want to try it. Um, so yeah, it wasn't much, but, uh, it was fun. Thank you so much. Um, it was a great discussion. I hope that the audience and the participants enjoyed the discussion. I will turn it back to Sidella. Sidella, thank you. Thank you so much, Beirut. And thank you to each of our panelists who really clearly have a lot of excellent advice to share. Um, I think we could probably talk about this for another three hours, but we are already a little, a couple of minutes over time. I just wanna show um, uh, just a couple of resources for the audience to take a look. And as you know, um, we are recording this, so you can always um, check back um, on our website later, um, but just a couple of funding opportunities from NIH that um, might be of interest to you, um, including the R15. And we also have listed some ways that you can keep up to date with um, other funding from NIH as it gets released. So again, thank you to all of our panelists, just um, excellent advice and what, what great perspectives. And we really appreciate that they took time out of their busy research and teaching clearly and their, their very busy schedules to um, share this input with us. And thank you to everyone for joining. So um, we hope you all have a good day. Thank you so much.